See my guy. <laughs> but the my guy stuff isn't in here. It's not? No, this wasn't the one with Are the you my sure? guy. Are you sure? Sure. Fuck. <laughs> well, that's okay. It anyway. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Hello, and welcome to Talking Too Loud with Chris Savage. I'm your host, Chris Savage. And today, I'm joined, as always, by my podcast producer extraordinaire, Sylvie Lubau. Sylvie, what's up? How's it going? Good to see you. Good to see you. Doing good to see you. (laughs) Head tilting. (laughs) What is happening? Uh, Why is this happening? So, um, look. We cover a lot of different topics on this show. We talk about what it takes to start companies, what it takes to scale companies. We talk about what it takes to build amazing products, uh, amazing campaigns. Every once in a while, yes, you'll hear a horror story too about a cold plunge (laughs) Um, and maybe even the benefits of cold plunging. You know, you never know. It runs the gamut here on Talking Too Loud. Um, But this week, we have a special episode. We're going to be digging into what it takes to make a great ad. And so we have a very special guest. Laya Kayami, who is a creative director at the Known Ad Agency. And we're going to be exploring a campaign really from creative brief to creating the actual asset itself, working with the client, what happens when it gets out into the world. And I think this is a super interesting episode for anyone who really wants to dig in on what this process looks like with like a really big brand. Also, I think particularly interesting talking about what B2B can learn from this type of ad and this type of brand building. So this is really cool and it's different. We haven't done it exactly like this in the past. So if people are listening to the show, check out the link in our show notes to the ad we're going to be watching and discussing. And if you're watching on YouTube or you're watching on Wistia, you're in for a treat, you just get to see the ad. So uh, very simple, very easy. And now we're gonna get into the interview in just one second, but obviously it's called Talking Too Loud. <laughs> and I mean, we wouldn't be talking too loud if the two of us got ramped up before we even got going. So Sylvie, what's got you talking too loud? You're so ramped up. You're so I'm ramped up. I'm extremely ramped up. So many things. I'm ramped up as well. Let's see. I could go one of two ways. I'm gonna go physical therapy. I'm gonna go physical therapy. Cause what would this intro be if I wasn't talking about diseases or ailments or pain um okay injured my back somewhat recently at the gym boy got got a little eager to be back in a gym routine uh got a little eager with the weights and you went too high too fast too high too fast you gotta have your form correct you know this Mm. better than anyone mr like i'm squatting 400 or whatever i mean i wasn't gonna say that on the podcast today you put it out there no 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 (laughs) Uh, I'm not gonna you say that. that one offline. You're like, offline, I'm squatting 400. Um, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, but basically, I am I am grateful for physical therapy because mm. it's... It's working? It is. It's not. is. I'm not all the way there. I'm not at 100, but okay. stretches and heat and core strengthening, all of this is very good. And uh, yeah. That's what I'm talking to you a lot about. So people okay. remember to stretch right. and think about form. And if you get injured, go to PT. Yeah. And also don't ramp it up too fast in the weights to something don't, you used to be Don't get too excited. Years ago, which is a classic mistake. It's I, like, I was oh, like, I can do this. Yeah. And it was also like, oh, I'm old. Oh, I'm old. Mm. It was one of those yeah. moments. I- it's funny, my workouts always start with a warm up that is like some mobility thing that takes like five to 10 minutes. And I've learned that I have to do it. You must. But maybe two years ago, I was trying to optimize too much. I was like, I'm going to get make these shorter. I don't need to do this warm up. You until love one day optimizations. It like, yeah. And it was like, it was like back and biceps or something. And it was like, do I need to warm up for this? No, it's so stupid. I don't even. <laughs> so I skipped the warm up. And I get into it, and quickly I pull my back doing something that I had done the week before, the exact same thing. And it was just that I hadn't warmed up. And I was like, hmm, okay, this is what it's like to be 40. It's mm-hmm. like you have to actually – you, you have- do it, And you do it, and that's fine. But you, yeah. have, you have to do that stuff. You have to do it. Um, okay, well, I am – I hope I don't just like spend an hour talking about this right now because that's my instinct. But uh, <laughs> on Monday, I went up to Vermont to see the total eclipse and took the kids and saw totality. And it was like just unbelievable, magical experience. And uh, 
Yeah, I just, I've never really seen anything like it. I have friends who've seen it before and I've seen images of eclipses and they never like, I never felt much when I saw it. I was just like, oh, that's like the thing. But going up there, we, they had just gotten snow the week before. So we went cross country skiing. So majestic. And we skied, yeah, we skied out to this field and there's like no one around and, you know, get the timing right. We've got our glasses on and it's um, me and Zan and then the girls and then my father-in-law and my sister. So six of us. And we're sitting there waiting and it's, you know, getting darker, it's getting darker. And it's like, we think it's a minute to totality. And Zoe, who's eight, she's like, oh my God, dad, this is so cool. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. She's so excited. <laughs> and Olympia, who's six, is like, this doesn't, isn't that cool. She's like <laughs> over it before it happens. And she's like, I'm putting my skis on. I'm going to go. And she's trying to go. And there's 30 seconds to go before the totality. <laughs> and where we were, is like about 56 seconds of totality. So 56 seconds where the moon is blocking the sun and we're trying to stop her from leaving at the last second. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> later dad. You just, yeah. And we're like, just wait, just wait, wait, wait. And then suddenly it happens and we see like the Corona and the ring of the sun around the moon and see like the solar flares going off. And it's like, we're in like, it's like night where we are, but in the distance you can see this like sunrise sunset vibe. You can see that there's a still light. And it was like, I saw someone describe it online this way and it really resonated with me. It was like the first time in my life when I saw two orbs in our solar system, like moving past each other. That's crazy. And I'm like, I'm in the solar system. You know, I, that's why I felt like I was like, oh my God, like I'm on a planet. And that's why I, I have, I recorded all of it. And the, and Zoe's just going the whole time. She's like, this is the most magical thing I've ever seen. Oh my God, that is incredible. <laughs> she's going, going, going. And Olympia, who was super upset before, now she's gotten quiet. And we watch this thing, and at about thirty seconds in, thirty seconds into it, we can hear coyotes and like owls and stuff start making noise because they think it's night. It was yeah. so wild. You're like in a sci-fi then, movie. It's what it felt like, and then it and then as it ended, and I was like, I think I'm a changed person. <laughs> like that's honestly what it felt like. I was like, I don't know. I get now why people like search for these things and spend time going to them. And so anyway, I didn't get it before. It was kind of like, I wish I had, I wish I had planned for this, but if you're ever considering going to one of these in the future, like a true total eclipse, um, you got to do it. It was get ready to be changed. Get ready to be, you're you're new. Yeah. And I will also, I want to be clear. I know some people listening right now be like, this guy's on mushrooms. No, (laughs) I'm not. Okay. Totally sober. I want to be really clear. This is just 100% High on human life, being baby. having insurance. High, High on, on life. life. That's what came from this. Now, if you could get this feeling from mushrooms, I understand why people do that. <laughs> All right. So let's get into this interview. Let's, um, great transition. R- wild interview. I mean, we also didn't say that before. Utterly wild. wild. Utterly wild. Utterly. I mean, you're in for a treat. So here we go. Let's go to Laya um, and the interview. Laya, it's so great to meet you. Thanks for coming on the show. This podcast is called Talking Too Loud because obviously when I get excited, I can't control the vibe of my voice. Um, And the way we like to start the show is by asking our guests, what has them talking too loud? So I'd love to know, what has you talking too loud right now, like outside of work? Like, what are you excited about, like in the world, in your life? And also, what has you excited at work? For sure. Thanks for having me. Um, So... I am a big culture junkie of all categories. So everything from music, um, I, I kind of have a side project with my friends called cult of sound where we, uh, do music production. So I make a monthly playlist and I'm kind of a cross category nerd. I love, uh, uh, you know, obviously television. Like, I don't know if you guys are watching Shogun. It's pretty amazing. Um, I keep hearing things about it, but I I haven't watched it. Same. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 great. And then um besides that, like, you know, I it's New, it's New York City. So, you know, there's tons of culture everywhere. There's comedy shows, great comedians, and music kind of leads to a lot of that culture, you know, not just the popular music, but uh everything on the outskirts of that. How long have you lived in New York? I've been here about 12 plus years now. Okay. So you can call yourself a New Yorker. Official. Yeah, I think I'm jilted enough to be. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> 
Awesome. And is there anything at work at right now that you're like really excited about that's oh, getting yeah. you going? Um, so, you know, like I think in our industry is quite weird in that it fluctuates uh, and coming back from COVID has been a weird um, clients are just starting to build up their budgets and get a little comfortable with doing edgier work. I think before okay. it was a lot of like uneasiness. So we're definitely starting to get clients that want to do bigger edgier campaigns um and uh open up the spending a little bit to do some of those pieces of work like what widen did after 40 years for mcdonald's 40 year celebration uh that brand has been very stagnant and has kind of done the same model of advertising for for years and uh widen kind of for their 40 years released like an anime video uh that was like celebrating their 40 years um and kind of pushed them outside of culture so i think the really exciting things is when um brands push beyond what they're comfortable with i had not heard about this that basically people weren't taking the same types of risks can you just mm -hmm. like bring us like why do you think that is and like what does that look like yeah i mean you know in advertising and creative like we kind of talk about like the 90s as being like the freedom of you know everything anything goes and and there was a lot of creativity and then kind of after that, it started to really rain down. And I like to call it uh, a little bit of a human centipede effect. Too many people in the middle. <laughs> I don't know if that's appropriate for your listeners, but a great idea used to go through a minimal number of uh, people. Uh, people, yeah, human centipede. And, yeah. Uh, and now uh, the, the, it, the process became more and more convoluted. And I think clients, as a result, became more and more conservative with what they were willing to do they were looking for their core customers and their core customers are actually usually the less likely to take risks and go outside of that it's the new customers and the and the diehard customers that are the ones that will like really be receptive to um, edgier work and I think the mentality has gone for let's just instead of trying to make like lukewarm work that attracts like the median of the audience let's try to create edgy work that attracts our diehards and gets like new people into the market that's super wow. interesting that's interesting and is that are they doing that out of necessity or do you think it's just like comfort or is it to survive or like how do you why do you think they're finally removing links in the human centipede <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think, you know, like there's a lot of, uh, uh, agencies that are changing that model. Like, you know, mother New York, for example, is famous for, uh, putting creatives to directly pitch to clients. Usually you have okay. like account people and strategists. Uh, some people would think that's, that's dangerous waters, but you know, like there's a lot of <laughs> risk taking that's, uh, you know, because of, uh, you know, little Freudian slips like mine. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but, uh, I think, uh, clients are appreciating that and they're appreciating the diversity of voices that are coming out and their audience is more diverse like if you look at American audience it's not just this cliche you know the Mad Men era of advertising where uh, it's a certain type of voice doing these ads and and they start to feel very uh, stagnant and stagnant water pollutes so I think for brands they're seeing the opportunity in uh, diversifying and doing edgier work and when the other brands are doing it, you don't want your brand to be left in the dust. So when you're seeing brands win awards and get recognition on ad age and people, especially in the younger audience and Gen Z and social, people are talking about campaigns like it's culture, like it's like yeah. the latest music video. They want to be a part of that culture. They don't want to be left behind. So I think that's start, starting to put a little fire under their butt to make a little bolder decisions. I, I also feel like if, you know, I watch a fair amount of like comedy podcasts and stuff, and I've noticed that the ones that are the most popular have gotten a lot edgier. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about where people advertise. Like I was watching something. I was like shocked to see some major brands on it because it's like two idiots saying whatever they want, like, <laughs> you know, um, like offending people left and right. And then it, the ad is like Shopify. And I'm like, whoa, like Shopify is advertising on this? Like this doesn't seem like, I, it, it struck me almost because it felt like something that wasn't possible like two years ago. Like two years ago, it felt like 
that would be scary to associate with the edgy thing. And it sounds like it's very in line with what you're saying, which is like, no, actually like the creative is getting edgier. And so then maybe the comfort of the media where you'd put the creative is also, there's more comfort with being edgier, but I'm wondering your take on that. Yeah. So I think comedy is a great example. Uh, there's a lot of comedians that actually are advertising for brands and brands don't even know it. Like they'll yeah. make a joke about a brand and it's inherently marketing. So I think brands have also changed their platform for a while. As we know, traditional advertising was television out of home. And then that got kind of old. And then they really felt like, oh, everything has to be social. But social also wasn't you know, creating the results. I think now they found yeah. a middle ground. It's more about a really great fucking idea. Sorry. It's fine. <laughs> it's a great encouraged. idea. Yeah. <laughs> Let the passion uh, out. Let it. You know, don't, yeah, don't you know, client back. friendly. I'm very client friendly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they, you know, it's a really central great idea and a great idea is not based on a platform. A great idea can live across any platform. That's a 360 idea. So it can get expressed in, in really edgier platforms. So when we're seeing um, brands, you know, like utilize platforms like Reddit and, you know, where people are at, like where, depending on the brand, but there's, you know, audiences beyond just your like cliche branded social Instagram post or, you know, yeah. uh, TV. It's like even thinking about the media placement uh, of, of those ads, you know, like what's the purpose of the media, why it's running, where it's running, and then timing it. There's so many layers. Like over the years, I think I've really learned that it's not about where brands even advertise. It's thinking of a really strong strategy of like how they do it and when they do it. Interesting. Yeah, it's funny. It's all it's I don't know if this is just like this is weird timing, I guess, but we had a live event yesterday. We have this report called the State of Video Report, and every year we do this huge analysis. It was like ninety million videos and uh, thousands of people surveyed and all all this stuff to like pull out the insights of what are people watching, whatever. It's very work focused. It is like this is how you make videos that are gonna work. This is what engagement looks like. But some of the people in the comments are like going wild. Like they're, they're <laughs> signing up with like a business email and it doesn't seem like they're at work. Like they are like, it's a funny thing. It's like the filters are off and it's just, it's like another connection point for me to this same idea of like almost people being more comfortable, just like letting it rip, I think. And then like when we're around that, you know, and as consumers, it also shows up at work. It's interesting to see how the culture shifting in that way. For sure. It's the transparency. I think people are sick of like being talked to like they're idiots or we need to be censored or advertised to like we're kids. We kind of just want to be uh, our egos a little bolstered, you know, like get, feed us what we want. It's the good marketing feeds feeds us what we want, not uh, like caters to our stupidity, you know? <laughs> I love that. Okay. Well, let's get into this, um, to this ad. So, um, you know, one of the things we've been talking about on the show a lot is that like what things happen in B2C first, and then they show up in B2B and often they show up in different ways. Um, so I'm always really interested in like how things are changing. That's like, that's why I'm like so excited about this conversation already. I'm just like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> like how will this show up? And even like the example yesterday, I want to, go through and, and play an ad. Uh, I believe you're the creative director on this ad, right? Um, yeah, I'm the creative director and art director on it. Creative director and art director on it. Um, this is for Just Dance, um, which is a game. Uh, my kids play it, uh, so I've played it many times. <laughs> um, so I know it, it's close to my heart, but it, it kind of just, it struck Sylvie and I, and so that's what led us to like having this conversation. So I want to watch with you and then like talk about it and the brief and all that stuff. Does that, does that sound good? Let's do it.
Just Dance 2024. Well, first, I think like uh, Sylvia, I know that you found this at first, like, yeah. and you were so like taken with it. Like, maybe you can just talk about your your initial I was, reaction. I was blown away by the energy of it. I think that's what hit me. Like the. Like you saw, even while you were playing it again, I was dancing and, you know, I love Bad Bunny, so it's a big part of it. But like just the movement in it felt so fresh. And I think the colors too, just like they popped. And I was like, shoot, I want to I wanna buy this game. <laughs> like I've never played this game, but I want to buy this game and play it immediately. So that's that's what spoke to me. Yeah, I think for me, it's like I know the game, and I, I, and I found myself like bopping along to it, and then also I, I like I, the more times I watched it, I thought it was interesting because like I think of this as a game that my kids play, but there's no kids really in this. It's like adults dancing, and so then that got me thinking about like, well, what was the brief, and who is the audience, and you know, is this actually is there actually more adults that play this game than children, and like <laughs> that's what I keep thinking about, and that's what I would talk to you about. It's like. You know, um, yeah, like how did this how did this project get started and who is the target? Is it is it adults? Is it adults who buy things for kids? Is it kids like and I don't know, this is it's not very often that we hear from somebody on like an ad like this that you might actually see on TV and like what what is the goal? So I'd love if you could kind of start there. Like how did this come to be? What was the goal of this? Yeah, so um Little history on Just Dance. Uh, Ubisoft's first Just Dance came out in November 2009. So there's a lot of editions of this game. So the fan base is strong. They are like diehards. It's one of their biggest games other than League of Legends. So being that the fan base already knows the game, they know the characters, they live and breathe every edition that comes out. So we didn't necessarily need to get a whole lot of new people onto yeah. this game because the world knows about it. And this ad is aired globally in 36 languages across the world. So it needed to be able to communicate the goal of the game without uh, a lot of dialogue and, and, and really send the message. But what was interesting was when they came to us with the brief, they said, we have the latest, you know, 2024 edition we've done all the things we've done all the ads we've done ads in the past you know cg ads people leaving a party what do we do this year that's different like we as a company that's done so many versions what do we do that's different and how do we show that how do we create excitement for a game that's been around for so long already we were like well what does this edition have to offer and they were like we have 40 new songs we have a bunch of new levels and we have this new character disco ball, which you guys see at the end winking at everybody. Mm -hmm. And they kind of took us through the brief of like a little bit about their brand and the number one, like they didn't know what they wanted. They just wanted to promote this game on a global basis. So for, for me as a creative and my, uh, my partner who uh, is a writer, we kind of, looked at the game and we were like the most interesting thing that all fans talk about is how infectious the game is it's mm -hmm. like they talk about how addictive it is and once you start playing like you literally can't stop and uh when we were approaching our strategy we were we were uh using song titles for a strategy and one of my favorite uh old school uh uh brian ferry from the roxy music did a track called you can't stop the dance it was like one of after he left roxy music and did his like solo uh new wave disco career um and the song you can't stop the dance was kind of the inspiration for this entire campaign was okay. that also a little bit of like beetlejuice you know like when the, <laughs> when you get the possessed with the dance oh yeah like, the day you can't yeah, stop yeah. it yeah like like you know you get like the tappy foot you get like a little like your hip starts popping and we thought like that's what this game is it's like it's like the pandemic it's contagious it starts with two people <laughs> playing the game and then before you know it it spreads like wildfire and everyone is infected with it so that was the concept was showing how infectious this game is but it wasn't just the concept the 
they they as a brand who is so colorful and visual with these new characters they wanted to create a world that you know and you know we could have gone like crazy cgi and million dollar budget with it i think originally we wrote a million dollar spot <laughs> and they were like bring it back guys we do not have that budget for the 14th <laughs> edition of the game so we had to come up with like really creative solutions of how to make this and make it look different and cool and we really love this kind of uh quirkier world of directors like Pedro Almovar uh from Spain and like and uh a little bit of Wes Anderson like this kind of quirky offbeat world yeah. where and the visual structure kind of shows yeah that yeah, yeah. that's the color palette and like yeah. going a little different where this visual world where when you know two kids two teenagers start playing suddenly and and you know to answer your former question everyone plays this game you know parents yeah. play this game with their kids it is a mainly kids but teens they have dance competitions in france for this game there's like voguing competitions around this game because the song diversity is so broad um but also they've done like poppy tracks every year and we were like you guys have bad bunny this year we have to take this track this bad bunny in self is like one of the most infectious yeah. musicians out there so infectious track infectious game let's create a world pandemic with our song and then all ends with uh disco ball the character taking over the whole earth and winking at everyone just really communicating that concept that you can't stop the dance that's I love cool that. i love i love peeking behind that curtain yeah, and then you have the concept and you like I guess have the what you think the budget is and then how do you pitch the client? How do you get them on board with this idea? Yeah, so uh you know, there's different creative processes, but like what what I love to do is like kind of go into the client in like a little bit of a TED Talk format, like before just being like, "Hey, here's the idea." It's like you walk them through like the 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 imagining process with you. It's like imagine like you know, whether it's through GIFs, through, you know, mid-journey AI visuals, whatever, however way you want to start your presentation, take them into that world and, and into that world of where, you know, you start playing Just Dance and it starts taking over the world. We show them how their characters could come into this world, right? Like as the teacher, as you saw, turns into the yeah. panda from the game, like all these characters start appearing. The, uh, we, we, and originally when we thought of this concept, we were like, uh, you know, we were thinking of like lots of IP. We were like, you cut to a news network in Japan and like Godzilla's dancing when he's conquering the, <laughs> earth, conquering the earth. Like, it's like you, you cut to different countries and like the concept was, you know, we go big because you always want to pitch the client where they're where they the best version of what their brand wants to be right um i think uh pitching them like with that dream and putting them into that world with you so we took them through that and then brought the world visually alive like that's kind of one of my specialties is like putting together the the photography because you know that hasn't been shot yet we haven't we don't have a director yet we haven't gotten that work to put in front of them so we have to have them visualize it and really live and breathe in that world that we want to create for them and get them excited and then bring the comedy to them so i think we were we had them laughing from the start and they were really excited about the the, the new space the new visual space that their brand could live in and i think they really really loved the concept of this uh the infectiousness of you know the dance pandemic as we called it um and being super close with the client our head client from ubisoft was uh, a joy to work with uh she was very helpful because it's 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 a lot of like you know choreography we have to match the game levels there's a lot of hand holding with the client more so on this project than any other project because there's a lot of uh assets that we have to match we want to match the game level like that's based on a bad bunny level that you know you notice at the beginning of the video game and it inspires the choreography a little bit throughout the game so making sure that the whole time as we're building this out the client is there not to like you know not to like necessarily boss us around but but to 
but to make them feel like this is a collaborative process that they're they're along the journey with us and they're having the fun with us and it was like that on this project from from the pitching process to a bidding for the director and getting that treatment to the shoot uh, where we shot everything in Lithuania and me and the client were you know uh, hand in hand looking at the camera screen as all the sh scenes were being shot at two in the morning um, all the way through the edit and the post production and the color correct um, to the VO to when it was signed, sealed and delivered. That's awesome. And so then does that like relationship continue through to like what the results are? Like, are you still in the loop and they're saying like, this is how much we think it drove sales or do they, how do they judge it? Yeah. So, um, our client, our client actually, uh, they do, they usually like to do a post kind of mortem of like how the campaign went. And we got one of the most positive emails from them that uh, within uh, internal at Ubisoft, it caused quite the splash. Like everyone thought that it was something very different for them that they had done. And that's hard to do again when there's yes. been many versions of this game. 14, so they, 14 versions is a lot. So yeah. <laughs> coming up with something that's actually fresh is like very challenging. Yeah. So they loved, they loved that. And uh, it got a lot of positive reviews and they loved, uh, they really loved all the extensions. Again, talking about like a really big central idea, they loved where it could go um, from a social and digital perspective it started a bunch of dance challenges so you could infect another influencer could infect you with the dance and uh we had like breaking news alerts on social where people would get infected with the dance and <laughs> you know within their internal company they had you know snapchat filters where you'd get like uh the dancing disco ball that would fly through your filter and the you know the stuff that's like really fun for the kids but also like the the pieces that are really fun for kind of like a little bit of the older TikTok audience, the dance challenges. So they loved all the legs it had and all the potential partnerships it created cool. beyond just the commercial. It seems like this is something that you just love doing. Is that am I right in that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a I'm a I'm a big uh, ad nerd. <laughs> Did you always know that you wanted to do that? Like absolutely you, like, not. <laughs> no. How'd you find your way to it? So I originally actually went to school for like visual communications, which is like a really BS, uh, like broad graphic design mixed with like, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was yeah. actually doing like, uh, I was uh, working in San Francisco after I graduated and I wrote uh, in retail actually. And I remember I had a client that was a, a copywriter and she was really cool and she told me about that she had gone to the school, Miami ad school. And I remember I went to go visit it with, uh, it was like a postgraduate degree and the school was, you know, flaming pink with flamingos everywhere and open space, <laughs> kind of like an ad agency, yeah. Yeah. like open space. And, and this was, you know, when San Francisco wasn't as decrepit and they were still in like a cool neighborhood of SF. Um, and you know, all the teachers were professional advertising people. Like they, they worked at an agency and they taught yeah. uh, ad school. So I just, I was like, I love to draw and I'm a creative and I've always had my foot in creative. I don't know anything about this industry, but there was a spark about it that was like, I knew I'm very ADD and I'm very like hyperactive and I love ideas and I like to make shit. So this is, this seems like a good, you know, yeah, place to like start. And immediately when I started, I thought ads were just like, Make, drawing like pretty print ads like my teachers were like oh these are there's no idea behind this they look beautiful but there's like where's the idea so I think honing my skills uh and and then I did like a quarter away in in Berlin and uh it, the Europeans are beasts in advertising like mm. uh they they also the restrictions are like in Europe are a lot less puritanical than in America mm. so mm. like like you can show boobs and ads <laughs> like there's <laughs> Amsterdam. I, I went to Amsterdam and like, it really opens up the aperture of your creativity yeah. to yeah. think of ideas, not just as like a brand, but just like big ideas and then express them in different ways. Like I had, I definitely had a style as an artist cause I, I do my own work on the side. 
but this kind of really allowed me to like express and be fluid in different styles uh, because I do think you need to almost be a chameleon like what works for Coca-Cola does not work for I don't know like Equinox um, so learning that and getting into the world was super fun and the clients are always changing so for someone like me who as a teenager could barely keep a job for six months and gets easily bored advertising is yeah. kind of perfect right because yeah, yeah every yeah. six months there's like the the climate is changing and it's exciting in that way it's funny I, there was a moment when <clears throat> my, i started my career doing film and video and then i started wistia like right out of college, basically a year out. But there was a moment before that, that I was like, I think the thing I might need is this, which is like working with different clients and making ads and the creative process, because that like, I, that gets me so excited that like innovation around getting the right big idea and having it be different all the time is like, and honestly, that's what a lot of the stuff we do now is like very similar in terms of how do we do the, how do we build a new product or how do we create a new campaign or whatever? It's like, gets me really jazzed. Um, I want to talk about one thing in here that is like, I think if you haven't been involved in these ideas or like big creative campaigns, um, or you want to, there is something interesting about how do you know when you can trust an idea? How do you know when it's like, when it's worth taking a risk? And maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Like, how do you personally think about it? The way I've done in the past is like, if there's two people I trust on something, and they really love the idea, even if everyone else hates it, it's probably it's probably a good idea. Um, but I don't know how how do you have anything like that? How do you how do you know when it's the risk is worth taking? When it's like especially the riskier ideas. Yeah, I think what you said is a great note. Like when you're uh, first coming into advertising, like it's very hard to have that trust in yourself and in your ideas. You're constantly have imposter syndrome and you're doubting it. Uh, and but you work with these brilliant minds, you know, I think I've been smart and I followed really great chief creative officers or executive creative officers who were really creative and I love their work. So I follow people and I learn from them. And I think as I became more confident, you know, when you land on a good idea, one, because it has legs, like if mm -hmm. you can go, yes, and it can be this, oh, oh, and it could be this, like you start to know that that idea is fruitful. It, it just can take, it can be expressed uh, in a lot of different ways. But when you know it's like edgy too, there it has to. There is a level of ma it doesn't make everyone comfortable. Like like that's why you know the agencies that are on the top are like Mischief or Widen or these places are at the top because they have these kind of minds at the helm. They're risk takers. They they see the potential of a great idea when ten others don't. And and I think clients. Um, I saw a, a really old uh uh ad guy i'm sorry i'm forgetting his name but he he gave he said the best campaigns that he's ever done in his career have always been campaigns that they've had to really push the client on because uh, clients are never going to you know there's so many stakeholders in the business and you have to really uh, take them through like some of the edgiest campaigns, you know, like Old Spice that we've seen when you yeah. learn about like what was done in the background client was not comfortable. Um, so I think what you said is great, like having having a few people that you trust that whose opinion you trust. It's also a feeling in the pit of your gut. Like you just know it like, you know, you're like, this is this is great. It's not that it's just like, oh, it's just funny or it's awesome. It's like you're like you see how amazing it could be with the legs that you just, your brain starts going in 20 million different directions with it. Yeah, I love that description. I love talking about the legs of the idea. I think it also pulls back to the the Just Dance example where like, oh, they started realizing there's all these other things they can do with it and the filters and doing stuff internally and getting people excited and like the breadth of the idea. And it, it but it is really an interesting problem because I think a lot of people would say they want to take the risks and obviously if they're going to spend money on that, they want it to work. <laughs> so it's like, but then like to actually get comfortable with the types of uh, risks that you need to take to, to stand out in a world where the culture is constantly shifting. Um, it's not something that everybody comes naturally, I think. It's not something that, I'll put it that way. It's not something that comes naturally to everybody. Do you think people can can develop like a higher threshold for risk? 
for sure. It's like creative IQ. I think, you know, like sometimes you with certain clients, like you almost have to like show them what else is out there in the world. Uh, like, like you have some clients that are more marketing savvy than others. And when, and some, you know, like some clients, like they have marketing people that came from the ad world. They're more savvy. They're more willing to work with you and push the work. Other clients are not. And it's, you, you almost have to be the educator in that sense. You have to like take them along. I think oftentimes in advertising, we get in this headspace where we get it, but how do you get someone who's totally novice, you know, in that world? And sometimes showing them, like, you know, for example, look at Liquid Death and what they're doing with their advertising. Like, this kind of very edgy, there's just water, um, but it's able, they're able to, like, put a spin on it. And when we want to do really edgy work, we're like, hey, check out this brand. Look at how other brands have been successful and how, why we think this is right for you. So giving them examples, getting them a, a little more savvy and, you know, almost holding their hand a little bit and making them feel like, hey, you're not walking on this cliff edge alone. We're there till the very last minute to push you off. <laughs> <laughs> we will be pushing you <laughs> into the moat with alligators yeah into the moat with alligators and the human centipedes going um if you could tell creative teams to do something different in 2024 what would you tell them you know uh it's changed a lot in the 15 years i've been in the business um platforms change like you know like vine was the big thing i think it's like still focus on the idea don't get caught up on the platforms because like platforms will change you know one day it'll be like you're making a design in photoshop or you're you know comping it in mid journey it's but those but the thing that never changes is taste uh the foundations of creativity like understanding design diversifying your interest like for art directors especially it's like nowadays we have a lot of art directors that lean on designers uh, and and that's you we got to be able to speak each other's language so just because you're not a designer doesn't mean you shouldn't know design and you shouldn't learn design same with writers like uh you know their joke is like a lot of copywriters are like film film writers or comedians that didn't make it but it's like no there's some of the greatest writers have ad, ad writers have gone on to then write shows and you know uh same with film directors like people don't realize like michelle gondry uh was uh, an ad guy <laughs> you know he did yeah. his first ad for volkswagen so think of yourself as being cross-dimensional always don't limit your creativity in a box and uh constantly evolve like be curious so yeah if there is a new thing coming out check it out play around with it like go go get a discord account and fuck around on mid journey or go you know uh try try new things and constantly make yourself a little uncomfortable i, I love, love that. that um Laya, thank you so much where where can people connect with you and where can they see more of your work um you can find me on uh, the good old classic LinkedIn. You could uh, <laughs> check out my portfolio. It's uh, basically my last name. It was a bad last name uh, combination with Kayami Nader. <laughs> like, the, like the Terminator. It's very bad. Um, oh, that, that's what that was. It, my old writer, I couldn't come up with like a URL and she was just like, Kaminator. I'm like, all right, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so Kaminator.com and, you know, and anyone has questions or anything like that, you can always shoot me an email. I'm, I'm pretty casual and flexible. That's clear. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you guys. I mean, come on. First time. That was her first time being on a podcast. First podcast. She was great. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I, I just think so raw, so real. Obviously, she's so in touch with like how she like feels things in the world. And that's what makes her a great creative director. But just this interview. Yeah, that was so fun and exciting and like interesting. And I don't know. I just I loved it. Yeah. I mean, I knew from the very first time I saw the Just Dance ad that whoever was the creative mind behind it had to be like kooky and colorful and 
zany and Lyle was all those things and beyond her personality it was actually just so interesting to hear about the client relationship and especially like the pitching when she was talking about Mm -hmm. pitching a great idea and really forming that idea like it can't be just like a vague notion you have to build a world for the client and I don't know that that resonated for me because I feel <clears throat> I feel like people are always they get stuck in the idea phase. Like whenever they're making content, they get stuck in the idea phase and it's because they're not they're not actually mapping out the idea. It's like half baked. Does that well, feel? Also, all, yeah, I don't know. Does that feel like you... that makes sense to me? I think also we underestimate how all the different factors at play. So like that ad was something that need to work in many different languages and cultures. Mm-hmm. And there's all basically all the constraints. Yeah, it's also just, it's it's cool to see such creative work coming out of agencies and interesting to hear about the fact that like people are getting more comfortable with doing edgier stuff. And yes. yeah, I mean, that's a lesson for B2B, right? For sure. That Go is like uh, the fact that our cultures, our culture is getting back to a place where you can be edgier again and it's going to show up in B2C first and then it's going to show up in B2B. Um, actually, it's funny you say that because Intercom launched a new website like two days ago mm-hmm. and Des was on the show earlier. Great episode we did with, with Des. Um, so check it out if you want to learn more about them. But their website's so different than any other website I've seen. They're using like a lot of classic art mm. as the backdrop. And it's a it's a big kind of like reframing around that they're an AI first customer service product. But it stands out. It's extremely different. They're taking a lot more risks. It's edgy and a very for edge for B2B, you know, I have not seen something like this, like paintings as the basis of your website. Check it out if you're in B2B. It's definitely worth seeing. It's very interesting. Um but yeah, I think it's like understanding where the culture is going and understanding what's permissible and then trying to figure out how you fit in there. Like that's the hard job that we have to do. But also I, th- I find it really fun and exciting that it's changing so much. And there's so much, you know, interesting opportunity here. 100%. 100. Well, look, this we love this episode. Hope you did too. Let us know what you think of the format. Slightly different than we've done it before. Um, you can find us on LinkedIn and message Sylvie and I. If you like this, you want more stuff like this, you have suggestions for episodes. If you give us a suggestion for somebody that we get on the show, we'll give you some TTL swag. Uh, We've started sending out more TTL swag. Love to do that. So just message us on LinkedIn. Um, If you're not actually subscribed to the show, please do that wherever you listen to podcasts or watch them. And um, I think that's it, right? That's it. Right? That's it. Am I missing something? No, you got it. Nothing was eclipsed. Oh. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. See y'all. <laughs>